today on Answers with Bayless Conley. Paul said, I'm going to go so far, I'm going to boast in the fact that I cannot do it. That the problem's too big for me, it's too high, it's too wide, it's too complex. I'm going to boast that I can't because when I can't, he can. And his strength comes into full power in my weakness. Psalm 119 verse 28 says, my soul melts from heaviness. Strengthen me according to your word. The main place that you will find strength from God is through his word. There are many questions you are faced with every day. We are all searching for answers that will make a real difference in our lives. It's hard to imagine that these answers might be right in front of us. Get ready to discover answers in the Bible with Bayless Conley. Hi, I'm Bayless Conley, and I wanted to welcome you to the broadcast today. You know, all of us go through things in life. Sometimes life has its unexpected turns. Sometimes things happen beyond our control, and it seems like life is coming apart at the seams. How can we find God's strength during these critical times in our lives? We're going to be looking at that. There are answers in the Bible, and I think it's going to help you. Stay tuned at the end of the program today for a special inspirational thought from Bayless. I'd like you to find in your Bibles, please, 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30. I believe that God has some very good things in store in this year for us as a church family, for us as individuals, but I think it's important that we're expectant and that we look for him and for good things to come from him. I think we perhaps miss a lot because of our attitudes that we're not receptive and we're not expectant looking to God. It's one of the things we'll talk a little bit about tonight before we're done. But as this opens up in 1 Samuel, the 30th chapter, we have the story of David, who is on the run, so to speak, from King Saul. Saul has been trying to kill David, and David right now, with a band of men, has been living in the land of the Philistines in a city called Ziklag. And David and his men will go out periodically on campaigns to fight against the enemies of Israel. And on this one day, they return from having been out, and in the distance they saw smoke. And I'm sure one of them said, that, that looks like it might be coming from home. And so they made double time and got there only to find the city where they're living, completely ransacked, burned to the ground, and all of their loved ones, their wives and their children, have been kidnapped and taken into slavery by a group of Amalekites. They had to have been devastated. And I thought a lot about it, and it's really hard to, to get your mind around what it must have felt like for David and for his men. Just imagine you're in a season that you're really endeavoring to serve God with all of your heart. It's just been a good, fruitful season. There's a lot of momentum in your life. Spiritually, you're going to church regularly. You've been getting some real nuggets out of the Word. And one day, you're headed home from work. You're in a good mood. And all of a sudden, you hear a siren. You look around. In the rearview mirror, there's a, a fire truck coming behind you. So you pull off to the side of the road. And then, zoom, a couple of police cars go by as well. And you just think, well, I, I hope nobody's hurt. You sort of pray a little prayer, you know, for God to have mercy on whoever that is. They're, they're going to help. And as you get closer to home, you see smoke and think, man, that looks like it's coming from my neighborhood. You get down your street and your horror, the fire trucks are in front of your house putting out the last part of a blaze. Your house is in ruins. There's police cars everywhere. You get out and go to run to the house a cop grabs you, and then you realize there's actually a crime scene tape around there as well. He says, you can't go in there, sir or ma'am. said, but, but that's, that, that's my house. 
My family, are they okay? The policeman pulls you aside and said, well, I hate to tell you this, but it, it appears that an organized crime syndicate of human traffickers have targeted your family, and they've taken your wife, and they've taken your children, and we don't know where they are. You stand there in the ashes of everything that has meant something to you. It surrounds you. There's little smoldering fires. There's people running to and fro, but you're just sort of in a daze. You're completely numb. Human traffickers, my children, my wife. And that's what David and his men came back to. And we pick the story up. I want to read just one verse in particular, 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse 6. It says, Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Now it says they had all wept, until they had no more power to weep, and then everyone turns on David. They unjustly accuse him of being responsible. So now David not only has lost everything he owns, not only is he responsible for, you know, that these men and now their families are gone, but his own wife's gone, his children gone, and now they want to stone him. They're blaming him for all of the problems. And it says, David strengthened himself in the Lord. Other translations say he found strength in the Lord, or he felt the Lord giving him strength, or he drew strength from the Lord. He's perplexed. He's fatigued. He's been unjustly blamed. He's sorrowful. How did he find strength? You know, in Isaiah 27 and 5, God says, let him take hold of my strength. Well, David did take hold of the strength of God. The question is, how? Perhaps he reminded himself of past victories. Maybe he prayed. Perhaps he worshiped. Maybe he considered God's faithful character or the strength of God's promises. We're not actually told what David specifically did, only that at a critical time, he found strength. And I just want to tell you tonight, you can as well. You can lay hold of the strength of God. Psalm 29 and 11 says the Lord will give strength to his people. Psalm 46 and verse 1 says God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Now whether you are in need of spiritual strength, emotional strength, material strength, physical strength, God has it and it can be laid hold of. And I just want to share with you four simple things. It'll help you to lay hold of God's strength in whatever season you're in, even if you're in the midst of a crisis right now, even if you're sorrowful and plexed and been unjustly blamed. Maybe you've been thrown into circumstances beyond your control. God has strength for you. And number one, this is the launching pad. This is where we start. We must admit our need for God's strength. We must admit it. Many times I believe God is reaching out, but in our pride, we're trying to do everything ourselves. I still remember Harrison, our oldest son, he was a little boy, and I said, son, take the trash cans out. Now I knew both of the trash cans were completely full and they were heavy. And I knew that he did not have the ability nor strength in himself to get those trash cans out to the curb. He said, okay. And he went out and starts tugging on this trash can. He can't budge the trash can. I said, let me help you, son. I'll never forget. He said, no, I do it. 
She's a little old kid. No, I do it. He can't. But he's tugging and tugging and tugging. And we, we were there for about 30 seconds. I said, son, let me help you. So I grabbed the other handle, and basically I took it out to the curb while he just hung on to one of the handles. He really wasn't moving anything. But, you know, he was moving under my direction, and I realized when I spoke to him to do that, he was going to require my strength in order to get it done. And so many times God instructs us, God leads us to do things knowing that we can never accomplish it without relying upon his strength, and yet we end up relying on the arm of the flesh or we lean to our own understanding rather than trusting in him. And God wants us to trust him. And to start, you just have to admit your need. Now look with me at 2 Corinthians, if you would, chapter 12. And here Paul writes about how he had prayed to be delivered from a messenger of Satan. And that word messenger, the, the word translated as angel throughout the New Testament. There had been an angel, a fallen angel, a demon spirit, if you would, dispatched from Satan, sent to buffet him or to harass him. And so Paul has prayed for deliverance, and the Lord did answer him. And I want you to look with me at verse 9 of 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. That is, it comes into full manifestation in your weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, Paul went beyond just admitting his need for God's strength. He, he went to the point, he says, I will boast in my, in, in my infirmities. And that word literally means an inability to produce results. Paul said, I'm going to go so far, I'm going to boast in the fact that I cannot do it. That the problem's too big for me, it's too high, it's too wide, it's too complex. I'm going to boast that I can't because when I can't, he can and his strength comes into full power in my weakness. Now he spoke along the same line in the first chapter. Look there with me if you would. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 8. Paul is quite transparent here. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and 8. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will deliver us. I like that. Past tense, present tense, and future tense deliverance. He has delivered us, he does deliver us, and we trust that he will deliver us. But he said, look, it was beyond our ability to deal with the trouble we were in. It was above our level of strength to the point we despaired even of life. And then I love what he said, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves. So we wouldn't trust ourselves but God. You know, I had a friend, his name was Howard. He was quite influential in my early Christian life. And, and Howard and his wife actually took over a small country church in Northern California. Shortly after I got married, Janet and I went and paid them a visit. And we just sort of rocked up one day, didn't announce. We were coming down from, I think, Oregon. And um, so we drove in and, and found them there and spent the day with them. And I remember... I'm walking down this gravel road with Howard, and he shared with me some of the troubles they were going through. There had been a church split, and it was a little tiny church, you know, to begin with. The church split, there was strife going on in the church, and he was dealing with some very, very serious um, physical conditions in his body, grappling with an illness 
And I'll never forget it as we're walking along the road and he's sharing these things with me and I'm concerned. Howard turned around to me and he hit himself on the chest. I'll never forget it. He said, but I'm not worried because I have the sentence of death in myself. And then he turned and kept walking. And I knew immediately he was referring to these scriptures. He said, look, it's, it's more than I can cope with. It's more than I know what to do with, but I'm trusting God. I'm not looking to my own strength. I've got the sentence of death in myself, but I'm trusting the one who raises the dead. It was an admission of his need. God, I can't, but you can't. And for some of you here tonight, that's your first step forward is to say, God, I cannot do this, but I am looking to you. And it doesn't mean you do nothing. Very rarely is faith inactive, which leads us to the next step. You ready? Get in to the Word. Number one, admit your need. Number two, get into the Word. Psalm 119, verse 28 says, My soul melts from heaviness. Strengthen me according to your Word. The main place that you will find strength from God is through His Word. John wrote in 1 John 2 and 14, he said, I've written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. Now turn with me to another place, if you would, in the book of Joshua, sixth book in your Bible, Joshua chapter one. And Moses has just died. Joshua now is saddled with the responsibility of taking Israel into the promised land. They've spent 40 years out in the wilderness. An entire generation has died off, and they've not entered in. In fact, Moses himself, this leader that was bigger than life, if you would, has failed himself to enter in to the promised land. So, Joshua, as he looks back, though God has certainly done some miraculous, some wonderful things, he also looks back on a history of failure. His mentor has failed to enter into the promised land. All the generation he grew up with, they've all died in the wilderness. They all failed to get into the promised land. It's a pretty daunting responsibility and job that Joshua has, and now it is his turn to give it a go. And look with me, if you would, at what the Lord says to him, beginning in verse 6, Joshua chapter 1. Be strong. Everyone say, be strong. Be strong strong and of good courage. For this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now, three times he said, be strong, and we cannot separate that from God's instructions. Joshua, this book of the law, my word shall not depart out of your mouth, but you have to meditate in it day and night. Now, that word meditate means to reflect upon. It means to turn over and over in your mind. But the Hebrew word translated meditate here actually is more than that. It literally carries with it the thought of muttering or murmuring to yourself over and over and over. God said, Joshua, don't let the word depart from your mouth, but you need to speak it as you reflect upon it, as you think about it. Read it and recite it to yourself. Speak it over and over and over and over and over. Then you'll make your way prosperous. Then you will have good success. 
You see, God's word is supernatural. Jesus said his words are spirit and life. The apostle Paul said this book is God-breathed and God's strength comes to us as we read and as we reflect. I think some of us, when we get to heaven, we're going to realize we could have had so much more, been used to such a greater degree, but we were divorced from having a love affair with God's word and it cost us so dearly. We won't know till we get into that glory land. I'm telling you, it is an amazing source of strength. It's how faith comes into our lives. Some of you, Maybe like me growing up, you remember the old Popeye cartoons? And usually, I think it was Bluto, Popeye's, you know, great nemesis. They'd be fighting, and Bluto would be beating the heck out of him until Popeye ate what? <laughs> Spinach. And then all of a sudden, he would get this strength, and he would win the day. Friend, God's Word is your spinach. If you feed on the Word of God, it will bring the strength of God to you. We were with a family one year, taking a family vacation. We'd actually rented a house, had all the kids, all the grandkids together there. First night, we're sitting around talking, and a mouse suddenly ran right through the middle of us, and I thought, that wasn't in the brochure. <laughs> and a uh, little while later, boom, the mouse runs back across. And for a week, we battled that mouse. We couldn't catch it. It was like Mighty Mouse. You know, this little bionic mouse, and we tried, and it would run behind some stuff. We'd go, got you, and we would move the stuff, and it wouldn't be there. And the, the mouse was so fast, and I was determined that before the week was up, we were going to get that little guy. We never, ever caught that mouse. And every night, it's just almost like clockwork, when we would sit down, he would motor across the floor right in front of us. And I thought about that mouse in comparison with another one I found once. I was cleaning, or actually clearing out a field for someone, and I found an old Coke bottle under a bunch of uh, brush and stuff that was out in the field, and I looked in the bottle, and there was a mouse stuck down in the bottom of the bottle. Apparently, there had been a little Coke in there, however, long before someone had chucked it out there, and the mouse had gotten down inside because of the smell of the Coke and couldn't get out. And I felt so sorry for him, I broke the bottle and that little mouse just sat there. Could barely even stand up. The difference? Well, our little bionic mouse in the vacation house had lots of food, but that mouse stuck in the bottle had no food. My friend, God's word is food and strength for your spirit. God's strength will come to you as you feed upon the word of God. And once we have meditated and acted upon it, did you notice in verse 8, he said, look, you know, don't let the word depart from your mouth. Meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do. It's not just a matter of, okay, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fill up on the word. This is awesome. No, we, we meditate. Illumination comes so that we can do. And once you've meditated on it, once you've spent time in it, and then you've acted upon it, we come to our third step, and that is wait on God. Wait patiently, wait hopefully, wait expectantly. As we do, more divine strength will come our way. Do you find another place with me, if you would? Isaiah chapter 40. And this chapter actually opens up with prophecies about John the Baptist. And then there are prophecies about Jesus. And then it moves on and talks about God's mighty power over nations and over the peoples of the world, even over the created universe. And then we come to verse 28 of Isaiah 40, and it asks the question, have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. All right, how does he do that? Read on, verse 30. Even the youth shall faint 
and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fail, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Thank you for watching Answers with Bayless Conley. Bayless will continue with part two of his message next week. Well, I trust that the message was a blessing to you today and we didn't get all the way through it. So you're gonna have to join us next time for part two. And listen, if, if you're watching me right now, if you're listening to my voice and you've not opened your heart to the Savior, why not do it today? He loves you so much. God wants to have a relationship with you. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Come to God through his son, Jesus Christ. And now here's Bayless with an inspirational thought you can apply today. Hi there. You know, the scripture, specifically in Hebrews chapter 11, speaks about people that in their weakness or out of their weakness were made strong. How do we lay a hold of God's strength during the, the seasons of, of weakness in our life, during the times when our problems are too big, too insurmountable, to just uh, more than we can deal with? How can we lay hold of his strength? How can we exercise our faith in God to receive his strength? Well, here's one way. In Isaiah chapter 40, the scripture says, those that wait upon the Lord, they will renew their strength. And that word renew literally means to exchange. We exchange our weakness for his strength as we wait for him, as we wait hopefully, as we wait expectantly. I want to encourage you, take time, get quiet, wait on God, and you will experience his strength in your life. Did you know that the Bible is full of promises? Promises from God for you, to give you hope. God means just what He says. He is faithful to His Word. Bayless Conley's inspirational calendar for the new year, A Promise is a Promise, can be yours when you contact us today. Find a new Bible verse each month to raise your hopes and remind you that God has given us His promises because He wants to fulfill them in our lives. Along with Bayless' latest two CD or DVD album, this calendar will help you discover who God is and learn how to make His promises a reality in your life in 2019. Request your promises package today when you use the contact information on the screen. Next week on Answers with Bayless Conley. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. But we must choose to rejoice. Thank you for watching Answers with Bayless Conley. For more information and inspiration, visit AnswersBC.org.